Uh, it looks like it's got a, a critical mass here. Maybe a couple, a couple more folks will sign on, um, but I think we should get going. So welcome to, uh, to November's uh, NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group meeting. Uh, it's good to see everyone here. And um, <clears throat> yeah, it's November. We have uh, one, more, one more month for the year. So uh, going into the holidays now. Uh, and that's actually uh, one of the things uh, that we do want to mention. Um, so next month's meeting will actually be more of a planning meeting and uh, just kind of trying to get a sense of how many folks might be there. Um, uh, if you, you no, no need to commit or anything like that, um, but if you do think you'll be there, if you could raise your hand, that'd be awesome. Um, we will probably spend some time uh, talking about uh, some of the topics we might want to cover, whether or not we want to put together uh, another poll to gather input uh, from the group in terms of um, anything new they'd like to, uh, to chat about um, or any additional like uh, new contacts you might have uh, who we could invite to, uh, to be speakers. Um, and then also kind of going over like the formats of the meetings. Uh, we've had a few different formats uh, that we've introduced over the course of this year anyway. There's a, you know, typically having somebody come in and talk to us about a particular topic. And we've also done sort of a solution room, uh, open conversation, um, uh, you know, for the entire meeting where folks can bring in their uh, specific topics they'd like to discuss uh, or any kind of challenge or anything like that. Uh, then we also try to try to. Um, and it, it seemed like it was reasonably successful, but y'all can uh, let us know. Um, last month we took kind of a uh, a reading reading club approach where we had a, a few selections of uh, both you know papers and videos to review, and then on a specific topic in this case DNA storage, and then we spent uh, spent the meeting talking about them. Um, so that's uh, another format that we put together recently uh, that seemed to go pretty well. So yeah, the you know for next month we'll be doing mainly uh, mainly planning, uh, and it does look like oh thanks for your comments in chat looks like a few folks will will not be around that week, um, <clears throat> but that's what we'll that's what we'll be doing and um, uh, oh thanks Nathan cool you'll be around um, and yeah if you can join us great uh, bring along your ideas uh, about uh, just the meeting approach and topics and we'll see what we can put together. Um, another thing we wanted to mention uh, is that uh, through discussion of the co-chairs from all of the different, uh, the three different NDSA interest groups, um, both uh, standards and practices and content and uh, of course infrastructure, uh, we, we we get together on a quarterly basis, basically, and uh, talk about, um, you know, how the the interest group been working for folks. Um, do we want to uh, change anything up? And I think one of the uh, the ideas that uh, that came up in a recent meeting was, what if we, um, you know, in an effort to enable people to actually attend uh, different interest groups if they wanted to, uh, what if we actually had a quarterly meeting for each of the three interest groups, um, and so they could rotate that way. So, if you did want to have a chance to go to, say, um, you know, content interest group meeting, uh, you'd have a chance to do that during, uh, say, in January, and then the standards and practices would come along in February. The infrastructure would be in March, that sort of thing. Um, or would that be would that be too much time between, uh, you know, an interest group meeting that you're interested in? So um, yeah, I just wanted to, to put that out there. Do folks have any feedback on um, whether or not they, they like the, uh, the monthly cadence of how we have things now for all three interest groups? Uh, or do you all have, um, do you think it would be easier for you to attend each of the different interest groups in turn because you, know, you wouldn't have three meetings a month or two meetings a month to go to? Uh, so, so yeah, what, what do folks think about that? Any initial reactions or um, it would be great to hear. Um, and feel free to think about it too. It's, it's like one of those things where, yeah, sometimes, you know, three hours of additional meetings a month is, is a lot. And um, 
but uh, you know, we definitely, uh, I think it probably folks on both sides of the fence. I'll just chime in real quick, um, Eric, and, and say that I, I can see the advantage. Um, it, it does seem as though occasionally uh, it's, it's like a stretch to even come up with content for meetings. I think that this group has been really exceptional and that you've, you've done a great job planning and finding some different formats. But occasionally, I think that that could be a, a struggle. And if, if the group then atrophies a little bit, that kind of undermines our mission, right? And it, right. it is advantageous to be able to attend things um, on a rotating basis. My only concern would be if it kind of undermines the ability to converse, you know, more timely fashion about things. Um, I, we haven't necessarily been in that position, but I do know that um, occasionally having working groups that are really actively involved in something, you know, you wouldn't want to only be meeting quarterly. Uh, but that'd be the only concern that I could think of. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. Yeah, I, I think um, it would definitely be, it, it would be great to be flexible in the sense that, um, especially with regard to the format of the meeting. So yeah, if we if we did end up running out of um, or didn't have a topic for a particular month, um, but on the other hand, there were people who were interested in talking about a particular project or challenges they were having that we wouldn't want to restrict that kind of conversation by any means. So we could always, um, you know, come up with a way for people to communicate their their preferences for the month. Um, and I think uh, yeah, Nathan, Nathan Tallman just uh, chimed in there asking. Would an NDSA Slack help with that? Um, and that's something that we have under discussion. So yeah, I saw also, also Nathan, you just replied to that. So uh, other folks are too. Yeah, I, I think a way for, a separate way for us to communicate like what our bandwidth, um, not only for you know us individuals and our schedules, but also uh, with regard to um, topics and, you know, uh, whether or not we wanted to get together because there was some an ongoing conversation that really was was being beneficial for a, a lot of people it'd, it'd be great to be able to have that um way to just discuss and bubble up and say hey yes we do want to meet this month um even though we were scheduled for just you know meeting next month because we have a topic to present on then why don't we meet this month too because we have a lot of interesting things to to chat about so yeah that's all really good feedback thank you Um, anything else folks want to mention on that? I uh, see a comment from Martha saying, could we save the date for monthly meetings but cancel if there are no topics for that month? Yeah, that's, that's uh, yeah, definitely to me, that seems like a possibility. Um, we've got our, you know, third Monday of the month out there. Um, and we try, you know, we try to announce what's going on well ahead of time, um, but we could also announce that we don't have anything or we'd like to change the format and see what folks, um, folks have to say. So, um, okay. <laughs> Absolutely, Chelsea. Uh, yeah. No one is ever upset about the gift of extra time, no doubt. Um, and then, yeah, Nathan mentioned, keep in mind what the external messaging will be on ndsa.org. Uh, there will be messaging there uh, in that type of situation. So people are kept in the loop. Yeah, good point. So, okay, um, we're at about 10 after. So why don't we move on here? Um, yeah, I don't have any other housekeeping things or just logistics to go over. Uh, thank you everyone for adding a few things to the notes here uh, with regard to the um, meeting schedule. And um, yeah, why don't we go ahead and move on to the presentation. So, um, you know, one of the things that uh, was a topic that you know I don't, I don't think it actually bubbled up in our poll, but um, there has been interested in uh, interest in it. Um, is talking about uh, metrics and how to bubble up information 
or build transparency into a digital preservation repository. So um, that's something that uh, we've done at CDL for a while now. Um, let me go ahead and share out my screen with uh, the presentation. I can everybody see that okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. All right. I'll put this into presentation mode, but I'll be bouncing back out for some demonstration time. So you, you'll have to forgive me. Um, because of the way things are wired up here, I need to be on our VPN in order to get to uh, some of the screens that I'm going to share out. Uh, so if my connection starts to drop, just uh, uh, please go ahead and uh, put a note in chat and I'll see if I can do anything about it. Maybe turn off my video. So yeah, this is um, it's a presentation about building transparency into a preservation repository. Um, that can mean so many different things uh, from different people's perspectives, whether or not you have uh, like a homegrown preservation repository like we do at CDL, whether you're using something like Preservica or another solution that's out there uh, that has metrics built into it, um, enables you uh, to do a bunch of different things, you know, to, like what, present, pre uh, what transparency really means um, can take on, uh, you know, a number of different forms. Um, and so that's why, you know, for, for us, we just wanted to start with you know, how do we define transparency? Um, I think you all have heard me talk a little bit about uh, the Merit Preservation Repository at CDL before. And, um, you know, just give you a quick, uh, you know, 10 second <laughs> uh, rundown on that. But, you know, essentially our, our preservation repository is something that was built uh, over the course of the past 10 years and operating for that long. Um, but it's been augmented over that time. And we, we have about 200 terabytes, a little over that of content in, uh, in the repository. But, um, you know, for, for us, we're working across uh, 10 different campuses of the University of California system. So um, we do have a good need for surfacing a lot of information for all those campuses and um, different folks at the campuses. So that's why we spent time building um, a lot of this functionality into the repository. Um, so for, you know, for us, what this looks like is really um, being able to uh, basically execute reporting, reporting on uh, for financial purposes, reporting for forecasting purposes, say, for example, you know, uh, a campus has had content in the system for several years now, but, you know, their, their rate of deposit has picked up. Um, what can we actually provide for them in terms of forecast saying, oh, if you continue with this rate, uh, you might have uh, X amount of content uh, taking up this much storage by the year 2023 or 2025. Can we provide any kind of information for them uh, in that space? Um, and then, you know, for, for us, like reviewing in process and newly processed content, making sure everything's going well, uh, moving along smoothly. Uh, and when it's not monitoring for technical issues that are happening in the background. So those are some of the ways we're defining transparency. Uh, I'd love to hear like how, how everyone here might define transparency as well. Um, some of the, the less obvious aspects of uh, what we consider to be uh, transparency are like bubbling up common operations that have been executed manually in the past. So what that really means is, um, you know, when something doesn't process properly, you know, do we get in there? Does, somebody on the development team go in and uh, go to a host and kick a new process off, that sort of thing. How much time are we actually spending on that? Um, and how can we automate it? Um, the cross-team implementation for building tribal knowledge, that point is really about, you know, we have more than one team using Merit at, at CDL. Uh, when we do need to change something, um, you know, there's this cross-team effort and there's more knowledge built around it. Um, more people know how the repository works and that can only be a good thing. Um, and then, you know, there are times where in any kind of preservation system, uh, you know, you're, you're performing a migration, right? So you have a new cloud service provider, uh, you need to migrate uh, 
a copy of every single object in the repository to a new bucket somewhere. Those are really long running processes. And, um, you know, there's somebody who tends to specialize in those processes and, you know, hey, uh, you know, what can you do about them to make them less error prone? Um, and Nathan, uh, so you have your hand up. Hey, thanks, Eric. This is um, this is really interesting to see how you're breaking this down at CDL. Um, is this is this the right take to say that the way you're interpreting transparency seems to incorporate traditional systems monitoring um, as well as maybe assessment to some degree? Because things like you know watching for the system um, things that are going wrong, optimizing systems. It seems that there's this from what I, how I've separated them before, um, some crossover in that Venn diagram. Yeah, yeah, there's, um, I think there's there's definitely a mix of everything in here. Um, it's, it's one of those things where we're trying to take advantage of not only surfacing information for end users uh, and making, you know, making them aware of how, of what they have in the system over the course of time, um, but then it's it's also like, um, and, it, and I'll, I'll get through it, uh, this a little bit farther on in the presentation, like it's also about um, making sure that uh, the folks who work on the project and the teams that work near the project uh, have a good amount of visibility into how things work and when they don't work, what happens, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, there's definitely some overlap there. Is that, is that cover what you're asking about? Yeah, yeah, and I think it's a it's a helpful um, perspective. So thank you. Yep, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, thanks for the question. So let's see. Um, yeah, and, and continuing on uh, in that, uh, you know, in that vein, um, you know, who's, what are, what our, uh, are our audiences? Um, who's out there? Who's interested in seeing what? Um, with regard to these use cases, like financial reporting, you can imagine that you know AULs and heads of preservation at different campuses or their affiliated memory organizations. You know, those are the folks who really want to kind of uh, get a handle on um, what it looks like in terms of you know their content looks like in terms of storage cost, um, CDL management, of course, and our financial team are interested in um, making sure that. We have uh, we have all they have all the information they need to work on. We're we're managing the amount of storage uh, appropriately. Um, basically, that this has to do with the fact that we recharge uh, each campus or department and you know a campus in, in specific for how much space is being used by the content that they have in the system. That's that's really the the primary charge that we have from them on an annual basis. Um, the reviewing and process and process content, yeah, it's, it's all about the product program management, the internal teams, and similarly with, you know, content specific issues, uh, you know, engineering, DevOps, um, folks need to be able to dig into things. Um, I think everybody has their own unique set of problems to solve when it comes to either metrics or, you know, usage or monitoring or anything like that. Um, here are some of the ones that we set out to solve uh, specifically. Um, you know, Merit has nine different microservices that are operating all the time. Uh, it runs on a whole slew of servers. Uh, we don't want to put any more burden on that system uh, than there needs to be. And it's, it's already complex. Um, so what we wanted to do is really build something lightweight, a layer on top of it that could actually pull a lot of this information for us. Um, so that was a problem we had to solve. Um, we also need to make sure in that, uh, again, in that same vein, like that anything we built didn't really tax uh, the central database that the system uses because that database has millions of records in it. And regardless of whether or not something's a table's indexed, you know, running certain, certain queries on it can be taxing. Um, a lot of well, not a, not a lot, but several of the operations we're gonna talk about um, that are, you know, we're gaining insight into or building tooling around. Uh, some, those things should be actually restricted in terms of access. Um, so, you know, like I said, right now I'm on VPN and anybody at CDL can see these, these you know, these reports and interfaces. Um, 
But uh, beyond that, we only want a certain smaller number of people to actually execute certain operations. Um, so we had to figure that part out. Um, and then uh, the, I think Nathan getting to your point about, you know, what does it really mean to like pull information from logs, like at a really ground level, uh, you know, that's, that's a project, a part of the project we haven't solved yet, but we're starting to work on it. Um, and then the last thing I uh, wanted to mention here is silos, because um, I mean, what do I mean by silos, right? There's lots of different ways of talking about that, but um, you know, it's like we have a team of three developers, one product manager and a shared DevOps engineer. Um, I guess you could, in this case, you could call silos uh, specialties as well, because everybody has a special, you know, focus on a few different microservices. Nobody can know everything. Um, you know, people are interested in working on certain types of things, uh, certain types of infrastructure. It's always great to enable uh, folks on the team to work on what they're really interested in. Um, but, you know, can can actually, can promoting transparency result in shared expertise? And we've definitely seen that happen um, because, you know, when we're building this reporting, when we're building in new metrics, it usually involves more than one microservice. Uh, and so folks have to collaborate and design solutions, which is really great. Um, and then uh, the other thing to mention, internal versus external usage. Um, there are definitely times where, um, you know, sure, an internal team at CDL, like uh, folks who are working on Dryad will, you know, need additional information about something. Um, but then, like, you know, imagine any, any campus uh, going through with a lot of submissions to the system being able to surface and confirm what's in the system uh, is of high, high importance. And so um, we definitely wanna make sure that, that that's a possibility, regardless of whether or not it goes through, um, you know, uh, an application like the one we're gonna walk through here, or if it's like, uh, you know, a new set of API endpoints or whatnot. So, um, just to get into the first use case, so that's what I'll do is I'll go through each of these use cases and then we'll have a little bit of a demo um, and uh, kind of take a look at what data is being um, brought up to for review. Um, but for the financials, um, like I said, we recharge for storage, but it's also prorated. Um, so, you know, we have a calculation that's going on all the time that basically says on a daily basis, like how much content do you have in here clearly you know, a terabyte worth of content that's been in, ter in, in the system for half a year it should not cost the same amount as a terabyte that's been there the whole year. Um, so we need to make sure that that information is being uh, clearly communicated uh, through their costs. And then, um, you know, their a campus as an entity is out there, um, an organization like a memory organization, a museum as an entity is out there. Um, but we also need to be able to provide reporting uh, at a more granular level. So um, we have this concept of owners through the system. That means a particular department owns a number of collections and we need to be able to break down their, um, their, uh, their usage at that level. And then um, to compare storage year over year, yeah, we need to be able to provide that for forecasting. So I've got some background noise here. I'm going to go on mute for just a couple of seconds. There's nothing like uh, having somebody start out uh, with some serious equipment outside your window. OK, all right, sorry about that. Um, I think it's all good now. So. Um, yeah, as as we uh, or as I mentioned earlier, um, we need to we need to basically make this a lightweight process on top of uh, a database that's being used a lot. Um, so one of the things, one of the first things we created was this uh, was a secondary database uh, that essentially um, exists outside of the, the core core database, and we on a daily basis copy information through cron. Um, you know, we copy certain records from the inventory to the billing database. And this is really for financial reporting uh, primarily because you know we're we're getting information about 
the owners of a particular collection, the names, the billable bytes, uh, you know, what they had in the system at the beginning of the fiscal year, what they had at the end, and, um, you know, anything in between, um, like an average, that sort of thing, uh, and then rolling up a recharge amount. So from that perspective, uh, you know, any of these reports can be generated very quickly. Um, we can download these things as CSV files or JSON. Uh, like if I, for example, if I wanted to use some of this information to provide a dashboard in like Tableau or something, I could actually grab a JSON file, import that as a data source and, and create some sort of, you know, basic dashboard for them. Um, and then we also have the ability to just try to, try to tailor some of these reports uh, to specific needs campuses um, when they have specific requests. So uh, just to jump out of here real quick. Um, now, this is, let me make this bigger. This is, this is our admin tool and it's, you know, we're working really lean here and we build what we need to build and it's completely 1999 in terms of interface, but it works for us. Um, and what I can do is just kind of go through and show you like this particular invoice report here for FY, uh, just this particular uh, fiscal year. We go over to this um, and I'm gonna try to make this a little bit bigger so you can see it okay. Um, but what we're doing is we're, we're rolling up key data about, for example, this is the CDL owner um, and we have all of the different collections that CDL uh, as an entity has in the system. Uh, there's this whole series of LSTA collections that were made um, based on a grant several years ago. So there's information about how many bytes are in the system. In this case, I can set it to gigabytes or terabytes or megabytes, it doesn't matter. Um, and you can see that there's not been a lot of change in some of these collections, especially the, the LSTA collections. Um, but if we go down, you'll see to different ones like eScholarship, then you'll see a lot of new content has come in. But, you know, in, in general, what this does is it surfaces information on a per collection basis, rolls it up, shows you how many gigabytes or terabytes you have in the system, um, essentially calculates the, the um, recharge for that particular owner, in this case, CDL. Uh, and this is about $555. Uh, so far for this fiscal year. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's taking into consideration prorating all the data and everything, how long it's been there in system and everything in the system. And then being able to pull this out as a CSV and, and sending it over to, um, you know, not in this case, CDL, but then another case for a campus. Um, so it gives us access to a lot of like just essential information that we can create uh, a new spreadsheet for a campus. Um, another facet here, which uh, that I know I've talked about once before is like, uh, you know, seeing the composition of particular collections or as an owner, uh, or as the entire repository, um, all these different mind types of different data that are in the system. Um, we, can, we can drill down into collections uh, and surface that information for, for any particular collection. Um, and that's definitely something that, um, you know, campus libraries want to know once they've established a new collection or something that's been going on for a long time. Uh, and then here's just a little bit more information about the CDL collections um, and the file counts and the, the billable size. Uh, we also go by object, um, and then we provide links for actually drilling down into the individual collections again to uh, see the content that's there. And um, the last thing on the financial uh, kind of use case here that to show is that uh, you'll notice that um, we're we're logging content from. Oops, I don't care. Let me go back and we do this report real quick. So we're doing is we're actually presenting information over the course of time, saying that um, back in 2014, a certain uh, certain collection occupiers, certain 
owner had this much content in the system and then we show them over the, over the next year how much they deposited um, and kind of continue on and then actually also have a projection here uh, for what they might have out uh, another couple of years from now. So yeah, this is um, this is also a good way if I wanted to, as, as a product manager or services manager, go through here and get some more information about what somebody had in the system and use, use this data as a different way to, you know, with, with a different uh, method to actually kind of forecast a little bit farther out, I could do that. So, okay. Um, all right, moving on, um, just to talk a little bit about what this, this whole system looks like uh, in the background um, that generates that UI and tries to end pulls data from it, uh, from the repository. This is, a, this is a, a diagram that shows you all the components of the system, or at least a good amount of them. Um, this application runs as uh, in, um, a Lambda function, or at least we have more than one Lambda function, but in the, the tools or the reports I've been showing you are all generated by one so far. And um, uh, this is something that has, I mean, the Lambda itself has access to both these databases. Uh, it sits behind an, um, an application load balancer. Um, and then uh, we've got this, uh, these Ajax transactions going on back and forth between, you know, the actual, um, the interface in the browser um, and making requests to the admin uh, Lambda and then it returns information. Um, I had mentioned the, the VPN access, the web application firewall here. Uh, and then we also have um, one of the newest components to the system to be able to restrict uh, access to more sensitive operations is the use of AWS Cognito. Um, so Cognito has been, uh, it was challenging to implement, but it's, uh, it's, it's awesome now that we have it. Essentially it works with the, um, works using SAML authentication, uh, works with our UC, um, at least the Office of the President uh, accounts that we all have. Um, so anytime we're logging into the system, we're actually just using our UCOP logins. Um, and eventually, you know, being able to set that up for any kind of SAML authentication across other campuses, uh, uh, something we would probably want to look into, especially like when we get down the road and we'd like to provide, um, you know, self-service to some of this stuff. So I'll pause there just to see if folks have any questions. Um, and then we'll kind of go into a couple of the other use cases. Okay. So moving into the area of reviewing content, uh, anything that's in process. Um, so this is more about our team using this uh, to surface information from the repository. Uh, we use uh, Apache Zookeeper quite a bit for moving content around the system, or at least queuing things up being processed. Um, so being able to take a look at what's in any of those queues, so you can actually see like new objects being processed or something that got stuck and you want to requeue something, um, you know, that's those entries are marching along in Zookeeper and they all relate to specific data or objects and being able to, you know, gain some more insight into what is currently being processed uh, is super helpful. Um, we also have just uh, made an effort to be able to see exactly what's been recently processed um, and also like just gaining some insight into large batches that have come through. So with regard to the problem solved, yeah, it's really about taking a look at everything that's marching through the system. Um, there, you know, with regard to actually like seeing the most recently processed content um, this is just really helpful when, it, like, for example, when we've just gone through a round of patching or something and the whole sort of system has to be updated uh, for deployment or whatnot, we'll, we'll essentially pause any sort of ingest that are coming in. And then we, when we unpause that process, we can 
go straight to this report and see everything that was processed. And if there's something missing clearly, then we can investigate it. Um, but yeah, it's just really nice to be able to see things come through. And let's see. So let's bounce out really quick. I'm kind of mindful of the time here. And we'll go to a different part of this tool that we're calling the collection admin. Um, and you can see, let's take a look at what's currently being processed in the system. If I go to the ingest queue, I can actually see some of the recent objects that have gone through. So all these different objects have been currently processed uh, or have been recently processed. Um, you can see there's a lot of e-scholarship content coming through the system right now. And these delete buttons don't mean delete the content. They basically mean delete the queue entry, uh, but they'll all move off the queue eventually because they've all successfully completed. And um, so you can take a look at the, the access queue. Access for us basically means um, the different uh, assemblies that need to be created. So if somebody requests a digital object to download, then we assemble that in the background in S3, and then we provide them a link to it. Um, you can see some of these guys have been consumed, um, but they have not yet uh, completed. Um, and then a lot of these objects down here uh, have been completed. But if at any time we need actually need to like look into these more, if something errors out, we've got, uh, this is a, uh, token information that we can trace down um, and also like a queue entry that we can trace down. And these are mainly batch IDs that we can actually go through and take a look at an, an individual job if we need to investigate it. All right, and then um, the last uh, use case to mention here um, really for the more kind of like nitty gritty kind of information. Oh, okay. Um, Nathan, I saw you had your hand up. I, I promise this will be super quick. I don't want to derail you at all. Um, I'm curious though, in, in looking at that last table, do you find, and this sort of rips on what uh, the other Nathan was mentioning earlier, do you find that that sort of supplants use of logs initially? Like, do you end up going to those tables or to those reports to troubleshoot things as opposed to going to the logs, going deeper in essence? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think we we kind of like go at it through an investigation um, in stages. Like we we built some of this tooling to get us to the point where we can at least see things that are flagged, um, you know, just in the, the basic interface of the admin tool. Um, we've also built, you know, certain actions into the system. So if say, for example, uh, an invent, or what's a good example, um, uh, an ingest process hasn't completed, um, but we wanna try to just kick off the ingest process again to see if it completes. We can always hit a button there and re-trigger the ingest. And if it errors out again, then yeah, we'll probably go to the batch ID, look on the shared, the shared, um, we have an EFS there in Elastic File System where things are stored before they actually go into storage um, uh, and up into S3. So, you know, that's kind of like the next area you look. But at the same time, yeah, um, those batch IDs are all in the logs uh, for different services. So we can uh, hunt down those same entries in the logs to see if there's any additional information there. Um, so it's kind of like staged. Like if we don't have to do any, anything manually at first and we can just re-trigger an operation and it goes through fine, then it's great. Um, if it doesn't, then we have our typical like route of, of investigation. Um, I think that's, is, is that what you're getting at? Yeah, I was just curious, I guess I should have asked it differently. Like, where does this fit into your processes? But that clears it up a lot. And I could see it being very useful so that you don't have to dig too deep too quickly into those manual processes. So, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, and that's part of, that's part of like, you know, building this functionality in is, is just, um, you know, when it doesn't have to get 
to the point where somebody on the development team jumps in, uh, then it's great because we save time and um, we can, you know, move forward from there. Um, the the other things here, um, you know, in terms of like audit and fixity or replication, uh, yeah, we can re-trigger replication, we can re-trigger audit. Um, but there's a there's a good distinction here to be made. You know, the audit service itself that's that's running through constantly, looking, doing fixity checking on content that's out in the cloud, making sure that the checksums all match with the database. Um, that's that's one thing, uh, one operation that's key. It's constantly taking place. The other operation that we're building into this tool though is to make sure that all those checks completed successfully. If they didn't, and we need to know about something that didn't complete, then those will be flagged uh, in the operation and in this administration tool. So it's, yeah, it's really, it's kind of a two-part process uh, there. And, um, but, but it's a good distinction to make uh, in terms of like what, what's happening in the core repository and what is happening in this kind of like layer that's on top. Um, and to that end, we've actually built in a whole slew of consistency reports. Uh, just on a daily basis, we run these uh, to make sure that there's certain, you know, all the key processes we need to make sure are, are going smoothly are actually doing just that. Um, so those have been super handy because when, you know, now we've got it to the point where if something fails, we all go look at it, <laughs> as opposed to being like, oh, did anything bad happen today? Uh, no, probably not, but maybe you should take a look at this, or somebody had a problem with an ingest. No, all that can be flagged. Um, so yeah, why don't we take a look at those consistency reports really quick. Um, again, let's see, it's about a quarter of, and um, about, and then I think I'll probably just talk about one or two more things and be, be all set. So. Um, I'll go back to the top here and you can see our consistency reports have failed today. So let's look at that. I already looked at it this morning, but um, it was good to be notified. So these are all the different types of reports that we run. Uh, you can see that there's information about audit. There's information about the number of copies we have in certain uh, for certain objects. Uh, we have information about things being replicated across the system. So are they on all three cloud storage nodes, like every object should be, that sort of thing. Uh, the one that's failed is this batch folder consistency report. And um, we go straight to the top, you'll see all this stuff is processed, but there's one batch that did not process. And I happen to know that this batch uh, was a um, batch that one, somebody on the development team put through to make sure that some new functionality is working as we expected. So this guy will, this one will roll off uh, within seven days, um, but uh, it bounced to the top of the list just because uh, something happened that wasn't ex expected. And then, as I had mentioned earlier, one of the things we are just starting in on, we haven't gotten to yet really, is the possibility of using the ELK stack or what's now used or called the Elastic stack. Um, this is about combined logging. We're actually getting information from multiple microservice logs, bringing it together, being able to search the logs, and then also being able to display that in kind of a human readable and consumable way through Kibana. Um, this has been a, this is a stack that's been around for a long time, um, but our DevOps engineer is looking into it now because I think it'll be talking about, we're talking about metrics here so far of content that's processed, but what we haven't talked about are metrics and how, how well the system's performing. So, you know, what's that average time that, you know, what's the average time it took to actually, um, put together an assembly and deliver it to an end user? What's the average amount of time it took to respond to a user who wanted to download a file? Um, you know, where did any of those problems happen in the logs? You know, that's the sort of like, uh, really kind of like base level metric, uh, those sorts of things and things that the ELK stack could potentially surface for us. And um, 
yeah, I think I've already got gone through this, but uh, you know, bring down the silos, otherwise known as the, the really important team stuff. Um, you know, while we've been building all this, there's been great collaboration across not only individuals in our team, but across uh, teams at CDL and teams at the campuses as well. So, um, yeah, I think uh, it's just been very interesting to see that way. Um, and it looks like Dan, uh, thanks for your comments regarding Elk. Since you're in AWS, do you see CloudWatch playing a role? Uh, for example, would you go um, app CloudWatch Elk or roll your own ingest, ingestion system or CloudWatch logs? Um, I think that we would, yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that our DevOps engineer is looking into right now is um, actually being able to standardize the different logs. Um, but it would make sense if CloudWatch was built into there. Um, Terry, do you have any input on that? I This is kind of new functionality to me, so I'm not quite sure the best way we're going to roll up these log files. I'm just uh, eager to to get to the point where I can query them. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Elasticsearch is going to be the thing that goes through, and like you know, once we consume all these things and have them, as, you know, so there's a pipeline to Elasticsearch that needs to happen. So, um, yeah, that's that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean, Dan, have you have you all had any experience with this at yeah um, I asked, Berkeley? I asked because we're actually looking into this right now, and since our our infrastructure is still on premise, um, but we're gradually moving more stuff into AWS. Um, if we're going with an on premise solution, we probably just pipe everything to a central syslog server and then have Logstash or something reading from that into Elasticsearch. When you're okay. already in AWS, I kind of imagined CloudWatch logs playing that role as the central log server. So your raw logs go into CloudWatch logs and then they get ingested into whatever the, the reporting system is. Um, but I'm not sure. I mean, we haven't actually implemented that, so I'm not totally sure. Yeah, 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 yeah that totally makes sense. Um, that's going to be, yeah, I, I will get back with, uh, I'll go back to our um, DevOps engineer, Ashley, and see how she's approaching that. Cool. Yeah, thanks for mentioning it. Um, so the, yeah, let's see, the last thing, well, I mean, it's it's just kind of some specific functionality that's being quite beneficial lately. Um, not directly related to log processing, but um, we have been, we've created a way for actually scanning everything we have in the cloud and whether or not all of those uh, objects and files are related to database entries. So we're looking for orphan content in the cloud as part of um, the latest implementation for this tool. So it's actually been very interesting to see uh, how many files are out there that we no longer need or that were placed there um, incorrectly. So uh, that's been really interesting. But yeah, overall, all this stuff takes more than one person to build. Um, and being able to collaborate on it is, again, breaking down any kind of like specialties and silos. So. And um, we've already kind of gone over uh, some of this here in terms of, um, oh, yeah, just in terms of automating manual long running processes, yeah. I'd mentioned earlier the idea of migrating to new um, to new service providers, cloud service providers, uh, and that's been a huge undertaking for us. Just like lots of other people, whenever they do this, lots of other teams, it just takes a, a lot of focus and manual intervention. Um, we would really like to be able to do some of this uh, in an automated fashion with checks and balances in place. Um, you know, actually making something a primary storage node, adding a new storage node, or even to the point of deleting content from a node once we know everything's successfully migrated to somewhere else. So, and that's it. So here are some links uh, to just our, our repos. Uh, this actually, the admin Lambda function is actually out there. Uh, folks want to take a look at that. Um, and the second link here and, um, also, um, yeah, uh, our whole like ticketing and like what we're working on is in this Merit Doc repository. All right.
I didn't think the presentation would go that long. <laughs> I really love the granularity <clears throat> that you were able to get and all the different kinds of reports. And I was just wondering how many or have the metrics been used across the various groups to make arguments for more people? For, for more people having access or? More people working. <laughs> You know, as oh, more people for more, uh, research. Yeah. So on the content side, on the DevOps side, on the software engineer side, you know, as things are growing, have you been able to use these statistics or these this data effectively to argue for new people? Right. Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, it's a good point because um, I think in a way it has uh, we've seen different throughput uh, throughput increases. So, you know, um, more projects have been coming on and coming along, uh, more, more libraries at campuses submitting content to the system. Um, and it also means that some of that content has to be shepherded along uh, and, you know, kept an eye on that sort of thing as it's going in. Um, and, and that takes a lot of time. Um, I think it takes a lot of not necessarily engineering time, but it does take uh, you know my time and anybody who's working with collaborating with the campuses. So there's uh, as we see the amount of content increase and and at a rapid clip in some cases, then yeah, there can definitely be some justification there for uh, folks who are involved in um, you know in helping uh, that whole process along, whether it's accessioning or uh, confirming that contents in their repository or, um, you know, providing uh, some sort of consultation in terms of like how um, objects should be structured or collections should be structured or anything like that. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of work that kind of like obviously kind of branches out from there. Yeah. It seems I like think... the data can be used very effectively. Sorry. I was going to say, I think too, we've we've really justified the need to build automated tools for managing primary and secondary copies in cloud storage, mm -hmm. like actually building real automated tools to manage that rather than treating those as one off, you know, when you have time kinds of projects. So that's, that's been a really good thing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, uh, Dan, is, do you have a, a separate question or was that yeah, um, sorry. Was that, um, okay. Lambda. How do you like nice. Lambda for this? Any gotchas? It's it's really fantastic uh, because these reports are run really only during business hours, and some days we run a bunch. Some days we run no queries at all. So we're you know we're only paying for the usage uh, with Lambda. Hard cap of fifteen minutes. So you kind of you you can't put really long running batch processes in there unless you break it up into 15 minute chunks. There's also like a, the payload produced from a Lambda is limited to, I, I forget, half a gig or a gig or something like that. So, you know, when you need to produce lots of output, you have to save to S3 rather than just streaming it back from the application. But, you know, when, when the problem fits those constraints well, it's really nice. And we package the lambdas as Docker images, which is really nice to just build on that Docker expertise for deploying the lambda code. Sounds awesome. Is that so? That's your own Docker image. They allow running arbitrary images now. Yeah, it's it's based off of one of their images. Gotcha. And then you just essentially add all your stuff into that image and deploy it. Okay, so let's see, other questions out there? And part, part of me was hoping we'd have a lot more time for just conversation. Um, I apologize for that, but um, I, I would love to hear, I'm sure we'd all love to hear like what other folks' experience has been, experiences have been with regard to surfacing this kind of information or metrics. So um, yeah, maybe we can talk about that. Uh, at the planning meeting, see if we want to continue this conversation. All right. 
Well, we're running up against the hour. Um, I'll go ahead and ask for more time if there are other questions, but I think we can uh, start to, to wrap it up here. Uh, last thoughts? Thanks for the presentation, Eric. Sure. Yeah, so you all, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks for listening in. Appreciate it. And um, all right, with that, uh, I guess we will go ahead and wrap it up. Thanks, Robin, for helping out. And we will see who's going to be here next month in December as the holidays come on. So great. It's great to see everybody. Take care.